Hola, muy buenas tardes. Hola, muy buena tarde. Uh, hello, guten Tag, or vielleicht uh, guten Abend. And hello, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you, everybody who is here today in the Design Hub in Barcelona. And thank you to all the people who are watching the live streaming channel um, through the Instituto Ramon Llull uh, and also through the website of Ars Electronica. Uh, welcome to the Uncode uh, Roundtable, the, the Uncertainty of Meaning and Doing. My name is Carolina Jimenez. I am a curator and I am a coordinator of the research and knowledge uh, transfer area in Angar, uh, Hangar. Uh, Angar is a center for research and production based in Barcelona, uh, actually in the, in the nearby, very, very close, we came by walk. And uh, Angar is uh, one of the organizing uh, institutions of the Ars Electronica Garden Barcelona, together with the Institut Ramon Llull, uh, the La Universitat Oberta de Catalunya, ICA Barcelona, the New Art Foundation, Bib Collection, and of Festival. And uh, this table on code is actually the last uh, round table of the series of uh, round tables that have been proposed by the, by the garden. And uh, hopefully it's not the, the least, but just the last. And obviously, uh, because of this reason, there are gonna be some resonances and some ideas and some topics that has already, have already been proposed here. And, um, but um, in a way, there's gonna be a direct resonance with the opening conversation uh, that happened here yesterday, uh, which actually was also hosted by Angar in the framework of the European project uh, Biofriction under the title on uh, Biosonic Agencies. And uh, on this table on Biosonic Agencies actually uh, was revolving around the idea and, uh, and the, potential of, uh, the potential of sound, of vibration, of voice, and listening uh, in crafting dialogue, in crafting empathy, in crafting compassion and affection. Also some uh, other ideas as, as, as the importance of sound uh, in shifting agency or the freedom of listening or the idea of a listener, of a listener as an activist, uh, a listener not only from a, a human perspective, but also from a non-human perspective as an um, agent for emancipation. So in this table today, we are gonna delve into the listening process. And to do so, we have thrown, we have launched, we have uh, came to this proposition of doing it by introduce, introducing the, the idea and the notion of, of code. And, uh, and its interference in the listening process. And uh, just to situate a bit what we intend here as code, uh, as code, I would like just to make a little detour. And um, for that, I'm gonna introduce an image, uh, which actually is a photo. There it is, sorry. And uh, this is a photo that has been taken actually at Angar. Angar, uh, also uh, apart from being a, a, a place for research and production of, 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 of art, is also a residency program. And uh, I, this photo has been taken in one of the studios of uh, artists in residence. His name is Aldo Urbano, and he's a painter and a drawer and a comic writer. And uh, somehow I, I, like this, I like this idea of having this image uh, full of eyes, and uh, actually it's a, it's a little piece of, uh, of uh, Aldo's uh, use of the Oniric universe. And I'm gonna, I translated, uh, hopefully it's okay, the translation. I translated what actually it's written in the, in the image, and I'm gonna read it for you. So it says, when images are unleashed from the tradition that created their codes, they do not lose all their power, as some would like to think, however, they are like a comet that miraculously escapes from its orbit, and its trajectory becomes unpredictable, and its evil ceases to be submitted. Um, this detour, actually, the idea of, uh, of, of, of uh, 
you know, like introducing such a visual reference in full of eyes into a table that we're going to deal with. Some could be understood as sort of like a sacrilege or like a profanization because, you know, it's to, to appeal to the eye when we are going to be talking about sound and sound or sound art, if there's such a thing as sound art, but uh, which actually could be, you know, we could. But anyway, that's another story. We're not going to go through that. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird detour, but in a way I wanted just to bring the idea of this detour, right? Because uh, what we are going to try to, to say here today is to understand listening um, as something that goes through actually sound, that doesn't stop in, in sound, right? And, 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 and to understand listening and the act of, of listening as an act of deviation, in the sense that it operates by the diversion of attention, right? Attention would be removed, uh, withdrawn from sound itself in order to focus on the identifiable resonances that it produces. And this would be sort of a resonance that I found in this beautiful, uh, yeah, inspiring uh, drawing by, by Aldo. Thanks, Aldo, by the way, if you're watching us. Um, so, um, as I said before, in this panel, we are going to delve into the interference of code in the listening process. Because uh, code allows us, and if we say us, this is just like the inferior here, the, the human component of the cyber, to, to actually navigate the interface um, of, of the listening process. And with this, code would be um, unfolding um, a space, a zone, actually, a space for interaction, for mediation, for negotiation, for distribution of attention and meanings between the emitted and the heard sounds. A, so a sound actually that uh, makes sound and maybe for that reason, therefore, would be making, uh, making sense or the other way around. Uh, a, sound, a, a sound that would be making um, sound there, therefore would be making sense. Did I say it co properly? Sound? Did I say it properly? I think so, right? Anyway. Um, but anyway, I don't want to keep extending myself uh, because I am surrounded by a, by a bunch of people who are very much more and to, you know, have a much closer relation to, to, the, uh, to the creation and to the process of creating uh, sound. And um, yeah, uh, so uh, thank you all for being here today. And uh, we have here on my, on my right, Dani Moreno Roldan, he's an, he's an artist, he's based in Barcelona, and uh, we are very happy actually in Angar because he's one of uh, our resident, art, artists in residence. Uh, thank you, Dani, for, for joining us. No, um, thank you. Uh, after Dani, I would like to introduce someone who is actually not here. She is in Madrid, but she is joining us uh, thanks to our GT channel. Her name is Agnes P. Uh, let me see. Uh, so, this is Agnes. Do you see her? Yeah, yeah. There she is. Hello, <laughs> Agnes. Thank you for joining us from Madrid. And uh, she's also an artist. Uh, on my left, I have Angel Faraldo. Angel is a music, a music maker and the artistic director, director of the festival Phonos. Uh, next to Angel, we have Lina Bautista. She's uh, an artist as well. She's a member of um, the Life Coding Collective uh, Top Lab Barcelona, um, which is also a, 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 a collective that is having a resident in Angar. And on my right, we have uh, the writer and uh, curator, Luis Nacenta, which is the director of, of Hangar. And uh, yeah, just to go, just to, go th to it, um, I would like to start with you, Daniel. Uh, what, what, could you just you know, tell us what's your rapport, what's your operative relation with, with sound? OK, well, thank you, Carolina, for inviting me and inviting us, of course. Uh, yeah, like in front of this question, like I tried to think, like um, in relation with what what my interests are in my art practice or my research, and uh, just to be like re really brief, like I'm really interested in researching on digital culture and the history of technology or the history of the internet, and yeah, with a particular uh, with a particular focus on 
on yeah the community based relationships that appeared through this uh, history and this chronology and and yeah and also with a yeah with a focus in issues of uh, nostalgia obsolescence and temporality uh, just to be a little bit general and thinking about it now it makes a lot of sense to me because it's been a while since uh, i've been really interested in creating music and sound with uh, software and machines and and yeah tools that are considered to be obsolete like all video games uh, all uh, video consoles sorry and all computers all software whatever i was a lot into chip tune a while ago and for me i don't know i found there was something interesting in this relationship with this kind of software and this kind of tools i'm thinking about it i have no idea if it's true but uh, I always found that there was some kind of uh, something no, that made this tool not non-intuitive at all for me. Like, and I thought, well, maybe it's a tool that it's made for somebody that it's not living my moment. No, now they are tools or video consoles that some of them were created even before I was born. And I like this idea of a tool that maybe it was um, intuitive for somebody 20 years ago but it's not intuitive for me at the moment, no? Because maybe we have some conventions in the use of this technology that, uh, that weren't used before and whatever, and there were some conventions before that have been lost. And I like this delay. I'm, I'm a lot into it. it. I don't know, I think it's really uh, engaging and enriching for me, like, while creating music. And mostly I've been like, uh, when creating this kind of music and this sound research, I've been working basically with trackers. I can show you now, like one of the trackers I like the most. I'm not really an expert, but uh, uh, I, I just love it, and it's called Fast Tracker, uh, Fast Tracker 2. This is an option that it's the, um, a version that it's uh, optimized for current computers. And yeah, I, I just like this idea of having this really weird interface. It's not uh, code, uh, like hardcore code. I, I mean, I don't work with code when creating with music, but I really like to have this kind of interface where sometimes the interface is more relevant than the sound itself. Like, just to show you how it goes. It's an interface that goes from up to down. It's something that I like a lot. Yeah, just like a really brief example, but yeah, I like also trackers a lot because um, uh, lately I'm, tra I'm trying to be like really honest with my emotional relation with technology <laughs> and especially with, yeah, with software and the tools I use to create not just music, but whatever. And I'm just in love with this kind of tools, and I think somehow, especially with trackers, is because they come from an era of the internet that I'm really interested about, that it's uh, an era where it was not like our time right now, where internet and the digital regime is basically um, dictated by four or five big enterprises that are situated no, in California. No, back then there were like this huge amount of groups like really interested in sharing software, like pushing the technology forward, no? And trackers, it's, um, trackers were really, really related to this subculture that it's called the demo scene. And these demo sceners, it's demo groups that were called, like worked for, like to create, yeah, some work, software that w could be available to everybody. And also they had this idea of being like really efficient and really trying to push like technology to the limits back then when there were a lot of limits no that, uh, right now technology is like incredible but we have other kinds of limits and trackers for example work with this idea of trying to be as efficient as possible like to have a file of sound that maybe the song would last like 3 or 4 minutes but the file itself could be let's see i have some like 43k's no and you play it well, it's a long song, actually. And, and sometimes, like, this kind of experience, no artistic ex experience, if you want to call it, it's more intense when you look at the size of the file than listening to the music. And I also like this idea as well. And, 
and yeah, also related with video games and and with this culture, and also related with sorry with Aldo Urbano that we are working together in a project that I wanted to show you, like really briefly also. We are working on creating on creating a text-based video game and in an interactive fiction. This is not really related to sound, although it is a, in a way, because also there's a yeah like a layer of nostalgia in this research as well. I, I don't know why. And but yeah, this is a video game, but the thing is that the interface is pure text. And I love this because it's an interface that talks directly to your <laughs> mind, no? like to your imagination. You don't have any kind of graphic tra translation in between. And for example, it's like a narrator, like a um, kind of god, if you would say, that tells you where you are and, and what you see around. And you just input commands. No? Like for example, here we see that there's a blueberry. We take the blueberry. And when we try to take it, there's a rat that bites us. And then we flee, we fly north, the rat is still behind us, and then if we go west and we arrive to a cliff and we're kind of tired and we lie down, there's like this weird experience, no? Like as you're trying to lie down, you hear from a distance a high-pitched screech, it keeps ringing, and as the seconds go by, uh, you notice it closer and more defined, it's the strange roar of the waves as they collide with the reddish rocks settled at the base of the cliff, no? Suddenly the, the wind blows mightily, its buzzing drifts through your left ear, producing a confusing heavy blow, a heavy low vibration. This deep tone rises with determination until it merges with the brilliant cry of the ocean. They stick together in a honeyed harmony that finally makes you, makes you feel better. Like a subtle whiplash, the, the sound rises and falls slightly at a tremendous speed, almost impossible to perceive, as if you lose consciousness for a millisecond and it disappears with a time, timeless thought followed by a fine rhythmic echo. And I, I just wanted to read this whole paragraph because I find like right now, no, we are listening to this sound, no? And I, I, I kind of like this idea of sound without translation, no? When it's purely ideal, I don't know. And, and it's kind of interesting for me. Maybe I'm talking a lot, like I don't know if, if there are some topics here that maybe we could discuss later. Yeah, we can discuss later. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe now we can actually put Agnes is, uh, here. Let me just find her. Number two, here, there she is. Hello, okay. Okay, there you are, Agnes. So let us know about your relationship and rapport with, with sound. And yeah, technology. And I'm, I'm assuming Sarah is and I'm interested in sound and well, uh, the historical relationship between cybernetics and LNDP. And you can hear it well or not so well. Do we? Hello? Do we? Oh. Okay, let, let's go on. I think, I think we'll get better, slowly, okay. slowly. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, as well as the historical relationship between cybernetics and serendipity, and also in the music generated uh, communities around or inside the main, like Remy or Planderponics or this kind of thing. Uh, usually, uh, work with the standard music. Yes, okay. the karaoke track. I think we're, it's, it's, wait, okay. Let me just uh, unmute myself. Sorry. Oh, yes. That was it, the problem. Delay, maybe. It was me. Uh, okay. Now I think we're better, right? Okay. It's okay? Yeah, much better now. I don't hear you. Do <laughs> okay, so now I, we hear you much better. I am going to unmute myself and you go ahead, okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I usually work with uh, standard MIDI files. Standard MIDI files, yes, is the karaoke tracks you know, uh, that I recycled from the internet and uh, I manipulate with different uh, software. My relationship with sound and listening is uh, the deviation of certain codes, the random and the forced meanings. Um, the first time uh, I experienced a deviant listening I was uh, 15 years old, 
I want to show something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was 15 years old. Uh, that was when I found some video game cassette tapes of Spectrum in a dumpster near my house. And when I go home, I put them in, in the radio cassette and I listen to them. The sound of these uh, cassettes uh, fascinate me. I called, it, uh, called to my friend Stanis from my village and I told him, come to my house, I have uh, incredible music. And so we spent the afternoon in a dark room listening to the music. Um, we didn't really know what that was. We didn't know that those cassette tapes were video games. We just uh, listened to them. Uh, I don't know if you have ever heard one of these cassettes. This is the other cassette. These cassette tapes were video games. Um, this cassette emitted some alien sounds. If you uh, heard this cassette in a, in a, in a radio cassette, no? Where we, we were listening to a sonification of the computer code. If you want, uh, okay, if you, this is the, the, the different covers. Okay, I return. Yeah, I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want, I can show one of the last works that I do. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, it's okay. Um, this is the, one of the last works I have done. Uh, I share the... Yeah. Yes, this is one of, uh, one of the last words I have done. It's a series of compositions that are impossible to play via human being. It has been edited on a floppy disk. I can show here. And um, uh, the, uh, the files, uh, and in the floppy disk, disk are in MIDI format because uh, a floppy disk has a capacity of uh, 144 megabits. And, um, okay, I share another. Mm -mm. Okay, this is the uh, scores of these compositions. It's like an impossible compositions for play for a human being. Uh, this is the unplayable scores where the upper and the lower limits of the staff have been forced in an extreme way. Uh, the notes of the score of the song Shiny Happy People by the pop group <laughs> Rem have been uh, the quartet propagated and expounded for the compositions. Uh, and the elements involved in the scores are helicopters, uh, applause, gunshots, bird tweets, synth voice, and whistles. And if you want, we can, uh, we can listen something, yeah. but I don't know... Uh, Okay, here. Uh, for example, we can uh, hear the composition for helicopter, but maybe I need to change the sound. The internal. Mm.
You listen to me? Yes, we were listening to you. And you listened the song or yes, not? Yes, we did. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Great. Okay. I'm yeah, gonna. Um, yeah, do you wanna go on? Yeah. Okay. You heard uh, shiny happy people of the group REM in helicopter sound and deviating the, the different notes of the MIDI file, no? Thank you, Agnes. Thank you so much. So we can now move on with someone else. Uh, so maybe Angel, you would like to start telling us about your relationship with sound and technology? Yeah, certainly. And uh, um, well, I was, uh, when I was invited by Carol and, and used to participate, I, I actually had to choose uh, uh, something that was fitting this idea of listening, uh, uncertainty, my own approach as an experimental music maker, and something that had to do with code in some extent. So I'm, I'm going to try to, to pick some, some of the ideas that uh, Agnes already mentioned uh, from exactly the opposite um, um, uh, standpoint. So my, my background is in, 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 in music. Uh, I've been playing experimental music, mostly free improvisation, for many years. and. When I started working with computers, I, I had this, uh, this big, big question, how could I actually improvise, really improvise, with, with a machine that is by default purely and strictly deterministic? And so um, uh, I, I sort of, of course, started like sampling things and processing instruments in real time and so on, but that, I, I kind of needed a relationship that was going more to, the, uh, to something, I mean, my personal answer, uh, to, to that, that sort of relationship, uh, also based on a profound interest in, in gesture, in performance, and, and the ability of reacting quickly to, to musical imagination and to, to sound happening unexpectedly, so on. So, um, so actually, um, uh, in, in, in that course, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to bring something that I think it's, it's sort of interesting. I was playing with regular MIDI controllers, the, the type of thing electronic musicians uh, do and basically when looking at my interface, I, I, I mean basically you have a depiction there of what could be uh, eight faders of any uh, fader box, like, like the one I'm having in my hands. And uh, I was programming my own algorithms and things like that to make music, to process music, but somehow I wanted to, uh, as I said before, um, not like detached from any mimetic approach to sound synthesis, any representation of like nature sounds, pendular motion, uh, uh, sampling, storage, and so on. So, so basically, I started looking at this and I said, well, this is pretty much a waveform. Um, so so, um, so I, I sort of started imagining that I could really play uh, digits in a digital signal and send that straight into the loudspeaker without actually codifying that with, uh, with the top level uh, of a programming language. So, um, despite that was impossible, but, but somehow that was the, the, the idea, basically being able to enter uh, sort of like the individual samples that would be sent straight into the loudspeaker to, uh, and, and be, move, be moving the air in, 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 in such a way. Um, so that idea, I mean, back in the days, um, I was uh, sort of really influenced by, this was 12 years ago, something like that, uh, by, by these really constructivistic approaches like uh, to non-natural sound and things like that. So I said, okay, why, why don't I even uh, put different layers of, of uh, interpretation to this sort of uh, code or pre-code or basically digital uh, writing that I'm doing without a programming language in itself. Um, so going back to sound synthesis histories, like why don't, I mean, I don't know if you see these, uh, but it's pretty much a step sequencer if you, if you want to see it that way. I mean, so, so um, we're constantly working with those metaphors that this implies, I mean, we see a volume fader before we see anything else, but it's just nothing on itself. And if you see the grid of eight of these, it's like, oh, well, you know, this is like a square wave or something like that. And, and sort of I started imagining that I could actually do sound synthesis just by drawing waveforms with my hands, but also having sequences of pitches that could sort of like create uh, multiple layers of, uh, uh, of, of sounds. 
And, and even, even, even more bizarre is like, oh, why, do I, why don't I use the same thing to make an envelope generator so that each piece in the sequence with the same timbre, and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, I, I got obsessed with this idea and really excited at the same time. It's like, I can really play uh, writing uh, uh, really the waveform uh, without the need of going through, a, a, I don't know, a, a class, an algorithm, or, or a metaphor of an oscillator, and so on and so forth. So um, that's pretty much what I did and what I'm going to show. Um, but um, before I do, I also want to perhaps raise something that it, it's potentially uh, interesting for the discussion later on, is the fact that uh, I wrote this program 12 years ago and then I kept on improvising with the system over the years uh, non, in a non-continuous way. So every other year I would just come back to the synthesizer and play around with it a little bit. And so um, all of that, um, uh, the coder in me, the person who mm. had designed the algorithm and, and sort of like uh, took all of those decisions, what is the range of the instrument, what is the maximum and minimum frequency, what, what is the filter I'm going to use at a certain stage, or so on. I, I completely forgot about that. I completely forgot about the ranges or even these pan pots. I, don't, I mean, I do know what they do, but, um, but I, I do not dare to, to, uh, to go back and, and change, oh, I would like the instrument now to do something else. It's like, I mean, it's totally out of point. So, so that uh, relationship with, with, uh, with a, a, a computer synthesizer, which I completely forgot somehow um, how I programmed, and, and sort of creates a different relationship or a new relationship with, uh, with uh, the own instrument that I think it's, it's, it's another layer that might be interesting to, to bring uh, later on. Um, so I'm going to make a very short uh, demonstration, and I think it, it relates to uh, what Agnes uh, was saying, but exactly in the opposite way. I'm basically uh, writing those uh, um, uh, sort of uh, st strings of beats that will be converted into sound instead of... Uh, uh, so I think it, it was essentially the opposite, but I got lost for a second. So, um, so I'm going to uh, do it in a very rough way, so that, uh, I mean, to show uh, didactically, I'm basically opening the program, uh, the idea of of, of it was that I didn't need to look at the computer whatsoever, so everything is it's here. Uh, so what, basically, I'm just initializing this thing, uh, sending, uh, basically, initiating all the MIDI values in the controller, and that's pretty much it. And uh, should be a matter of just pressing play. So. Um, For example, I'm going to try to make a sequence that is perceivable. And with some envelope. So the idea was even to not have a volume control because I can draw a flat signal. So well, that's uh, I mean, yes, a very simple thing to show. It's an, a proof of concept, basically. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, welcome. you brought uh, a lot of things on the table. Thank you so much. Maybe we can go through them after everybody has intervened. Um, Luis, would you like to? Start. <laughs> yeah, uh, you are the only one actually without a computer yes. next to you. Yeah, it's good. I'm very intrigued. Um, thanks, Carl. Um, um, yeah, it's very fun. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be here to share the, the space with you that sometimes share other, other spaces, but more operative. But we, we don't have really the chance to discuss about this. So this is, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. And also I was thinking now seeing you all doing these strange things, I mean, this is, this is a super nice auditorium, and we are very grateful of uh, uh, Design Hub that have uh, received us. But 
it's fun how we are bringing some of the post city spirit here. You know that the 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 the, the main venue of Ars Electronica used to be a, a, a really connotated and a strange warehouse. So uh, I was I, I was reminded of that of that spirit watching you. Um, I will do. I'm I'm more interested in in uh, in the conversation with you. So I'll try to I'll try to be very 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 uh, straight to the point. I, uh, I, I, uh, how do I relate to code? In fact, I relate to code as a, as, as a writer, as, as a writer of, of words, but also as a writer of, of music code. So I try to do the continuity between words and code and, and words. This is something that uh, I, this is not the, the right time to explain how it works, but this is, so you have the frame of how do I relate to, a, to, a, to this matter. And I think that that code, it's a, it's a very well-suited tool to navigate uncertainty. And I think what Marina Garcés said a while ago here was fantastic, was like uh, undermining this uh, idea of uncertainty. And I was thinking, wow, this is, this is so interesting. And in a way, I think that what, I go, what I'm going to suggest is, okay, uncertainty is not such a big deal, and there are ways to navigate them. And code, it's one, one, one of those. So I just want to point out four different ways in which musical code um, is uncertain in itself and helps to navigate musical uncertainty and, of course, then other uncertainties. So um, because we have this idea that code is a very precise thing, and this is wrong. Um, Code is a very precise thing from the machine perspective. Mm -hmm. But code, it's not a machine thing. Code, it's something that we invented to talk with machines. So I, I would suggest, and in music, it's, I mean, I think this is, this is so in life, but in music, this is so clear, that uh, we work in a cyborg system, in a, in a human machine system, and code, it's a very specific uh, instance of that uh, cy cyborg. I mean, I, I'm convinced that we are cyborgs. We are all cyborgs. And I think the demonstration of that, it's how far can you get from your phone without panicking? So, I mean, it's, it's so obvious that the phone is a part of our body. So, and this is only one example of, of this. So, I think the code, it's a, it's a machine-human uh, connection system. And that already talks about the complexity, and you gave some very good examples of that. Uh, what Agnes was, 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 uh, was saying, it's a very good example of that. Other musicians, as Goodipal, for instance, that I think it's, it's fascinating, they have very good uh, examples of how complex is the machine-human uh, relation when you try that everyone understands everything. So we can think that code, it's a bit... Uh, difficult or obscure for us, but it's very clear for the machine. And the machine can think, but how, what strange way of talking humans have. It's very complex. And, and uh, so it's very easy to, to figure it out, for instance, a scanner, all the reverse engineering problems, how difficult for the machine is to read a handwritten word. That explains how complex, how, how obscure we are for the machine. Mm -hmm. So. Um, this is the way that I think that uh, code is deeply rooted in the, in the in, in, is uncertain, and it is a good way to deal with, with, to navigate, to be operative with uncertainty. Okay, I'm already talking too much. Four aspects of how uh, 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 code is, is uncertain. Code, as we, what, code is, uh, has at least two aspects. I mean, Code is about doing and about meaning. I mean, code is a way to tell a machine what to do, so it's a very fascist, and the machine always says yes. But also, code is meant to be read by humans, so code is a, is a, meaning, is a meaning system. Code is a language. It's, if, it, if it was just to give instructions to the machine, it would not be a language. So. When you do things with code, you are always in the doing meaning, doing meaning, and it's impossible to separate them. And this is very interesting. It's a very interesting way of think of, 
of music, of computer music, but not, not only computer music. So the first uncertainty is the uncertainty of doing. I mean, you all know, and, uh, and, and you just gave fantastic examples of that, that doing things with code, and we can just think about music, um, it's a, a strongly uncertain uh, endeavor. So you never know exactly what's going to happen. And it's very interesting to, to, to uh, try to think how we navigate that. We navigate that through the feedback loop that all music experience is. So you have no idea what's going on, but you listen to that, and you feedback what you listen to the machine. But, I mean, this, this is the most obvious. You, you, you all know that, and uh, uh, anyone with the, with the musical experience know the nightmare that it is to try to determine in clear ways what the code will do. In the case of music, will the code, how, how the code will sound. Huh? This, is the, this is an interesting thing. But this is the most, the most clear one. The second would be the uncertainty of reading. I'm very interested in the experience of reading code. And if you come to Angar after that, that's like the, the advertising bit, <laughs> that we have the, the, the Algo Rave uh, session yeah. by uh, Tobla Barcelona and Lina that will uh, talk after me. It's a member of Tobla Barcelona. I was going to wait till the very last moment to introduce that, but thank you for doing that. Yes. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> and in the end, it, it, this is so, that, I mean, we, we are in that really tragic situation in which, well, in, if you all come, then it's a problem. So I don't know what I would say, I should say. I yeah. mean, it would be nice if you come, <laughs> but don't come. It's already sold yes. out, so don't even so dare it's, Yeah, I don't try. know. Don't even, a, don't even dare. It's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. but, but a live coding uh, session or an algo rave, it's a very good example of a situation when you're supposed to read code. Code, it's not such an interesting literature for, 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 uh, for uh, normal people. But the experience of reading code, it's fascinating. And I remember when we were preparing this talk, Agnes said something very interesting. She said, hey, I don't know about uh, that life coding thing when you try to, I mean, in a way, you are being obscure. Yeah. I mean, you are uh, just showing people uh, 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 they don't know what they a are code reading. in yeah. Super Collider or whatever that they don't have a clue what they mean. And that, was, that is very interesting. That is very interesting, and in a way I agree with that. But then I think, well, isn't this the case with all the language situations? I mean, how would be a situation in which everyone is supposed to understand everything? That would be like a fascist situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how, but I am sure that it would be something like this. I mean, not understanding, it's, it's, it's very important, or be lost in the process of understanding. So I, I, I understand what you say, Agnes, and I agree with you, but I think it's more complex, and we can discuss this later. I mean, for instance, <laughs> and, and I'm sure that Lina, as a life coder, has something to say, but it's very interesting, for instance, the honesty of showing the code. I know some musicians that would never show the code, and they hide that uh, with a sort of philosophical thing that say, the code is not interesting, what's interesting is the music. I mean, I, let me decide mm -hmm. what is interesting for mm -hmm. me. So don't be so afraid of showing the code. So the honesty of showing something. And then there is a fantastic process, again, with the help of the feedback loop. I mean, you are reading the code, but you are listening to the music. And perhaps you have never uh, read a super collider uh, 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 routine but you see, okay, when that number changes, something is different. You are already understanding something. I mean, in that moment, you are reading code. And when that other number changes, and when they move to that other different part of code, then this new thing, I mean, you can, you can figure it out. You can figure, it's, it's a fascinating process. And again, it's a fascinating way of navigating uncertainty, because mm -hmm. you're 100% uncertain of what's going on. But you can navigate, you can relate to that complexity. And it's fascinating, the experience of, what should I do? Should I sit down and just try to understand? Should I just um, enjoy music and forget about this? I don't know, do whatever you can. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experience that it's more complex than you can manage, good. So the uncertainty of reading, okay, be fast. <laughs> yes, the, um, yes, sorry, please. yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm already too long, right? No, it's fine. Okay. And we will have less time afterwards. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So, then the uncertainty 
of reading, listening, this is very interesting, when you know the code of a piece and you listen to it, and, what, and it's very different. And this, this, is, this is a very interesting experience. That, I mean, you know that thing that you know what's going on, but in, with music, knowing it's a different thing. For instance, you've seen the code of the piece and you know it's a loop. You know it, you've <coughs> read the code. But you cannot hear that loop, perhaps because it's too long. I don't know, like the Morton Feldman thing, the loop, you know that the piece repeats about six hours. But I mean, no one, no human mind can remember that. Or, or, or you know it's a loop because it repeats, uh, I don't know, 100 times every second. So then it's a, it's a, it's a very clean signal of, of 100 hertz. So sometimes you have a very strong uh, discrepancy between the, the, um, what you know, what you've read in the code, and what you are listening, and you know that, uh, and you know that the, both things are related, but the, the margin of uncertainty is huge. Again, the only way to navigate that is to trust in the feedback that it's listening and, and, and it's music. And again, the only thing you can do to make that piece more interesting is to change the code. And in the end, and this is the last one and I shut up, it's the, the uncertainty of listening itself. This is the normal situation when we listen to music. And here the, the idea of code expands a bit. Mm. So, for instance, the example of, of Agnes is fantastic. I mean, it's this, this, I mean when, when, she told, when you told us, uh, you're kidding me, right? When, when you told us the other day that story, that this was, I mean, the idea of playing a cassette that you just found, and it's a video game, it's not music, but you don't know that, and you listen to that, and you think it's just music, and you think, wow, that's an alien song. I mean, you are making sense of this, it's just that you are, complete, you are using the complete wrong code. Although it's not, see, if, it, if it's, a, if it's, a, if it's a, a, an interesting musical experience. So, this is a broader concept of code. This is code of, of a cultural code. What's going on here? Should I be dancing? Should I be hmm. uh, uh, paying a lot of attention and very focused? Should I be relaxed? This is, um, is this ambient? Yeah. Should I be worried? Should I be scared? I mean, it, but I think there is a continuity amongst those, those, those two uh, different meanings of code. And, there are a lot of situations, I mean, listening to music is daydreaming. Listening to music is an experience of the virtual. You, never, you are never positive 100% about what are you hearing exactly. You don't know that. I mean, in the context of Ars Electronica, it's so interesting, and I'm very interested in that. All the systems of, of, of BR and, uh, and, I mean, all the, all the things that are supposed to create a virtual experience that is so real. I don't know if perhaps I'm a bit old already, but I just have to play a LCD sound system track, and, uh, and I'm already in virtual reality. And it's, uh, listening to music is an extremely virtual experience, because you are never certain of what's going on exactly, what is that thing that you are listening to. And then we establish some coding of that listening. You, you come to terms with what's going on in that music, inventing some coding, that it's never 100% musical. So I think it's possible to establish a link between that broad concept of code and the literal concept of uh, typing in a, in a computer, but that would take more, more time. So I shut up and I try to uh, continue the conversation with you. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, well, now, Dina, it's your turn. Actually, there's, there's, been, there's been, been said many things yeah. that actually <laughs> uh, now you put your hands on and then you're going to give us another layer of... Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, um, so I want to talk about my background first yeah. uh, and just to uh, show how I end up here today. So I studied composition in Colombia, uh, music composition, and uh, I started to be interested in technologies, and I went into that black hole a long time ago. <laughs> so I, I studied also electric guitar, so I started to play with uh, effects, with my pedal effects, and then I... I 
learn how to make my own uh, effects and uh, yeah, some devices to make music. And actually, yeah, I have something here. Yeah. This is this is some of the devices I, I didn't build and uh, I didn't uh, made any of this. This is everything uh, find from internet. Some uh, yeah, music devices and uh, effects and something like that. Uh, so I went into electronics just to know how to make the different sounds and something like that. No? And then I also met the modular synthesizers a few years ago, and I also went into that pretty uh, bad. Right, this is back there. So uh, this is my modular synthesizer right now. So I also built some of these modules and stuff like that. So I went a lot into that electronic thing also. Um, but at the same time, I also went into the uh, computer music and I also made some synthesizers and something like that, just uh, programming with Max MSP and also with PD and something like that. But I think uh, what I enjoy most is to perform live and change things live. So I also, I, I like, I uh, love how to synthesizers work because because you can play and perform uh, changing some parameters or, or even connect and patching the the, the, the modules in different ways uh, depending on what you're hearing or the audience or whatever no so after all that no not after uh, in parallel with all that I also uh, went into <laughs> live coding um, uh, so I want to show you a bit, for those who don't know what is live coding, we already have discussed a bit about that, and, and I don't know if I, if I should yeah, yeah. show some, something and then, and then we can discuss a bit more. No? So yeah, there's something I, I, I want to talk about before, that is about the... Uh, uncertainty and all that that we have been uh, discussed a bit uh, with code because uh, for instance with this program I'm gonna use this is uh, Tidal Cycles is one of the most used uh, softwares of live coding I can play a sound exactly the sound I I choose, for example, I can do something like this. You're saying good, no? <laughs> uh, actually, I can, can put the whole word sound and then put something like glitch. And let's see in, if this works because sometimes, yeah, because sometimes Super Collider is uh, behind and it doesn't work and I need to restart the whole thing and stuff, no? So, you, I think you can kind of understand how I've done that, no? So I just called this sound that I have in my computer. So the sound is going to be the same every time I play this. But if I choose to the computer to make, uh, to choose another sound similar or, the, or in the same folder, then I can do something like this. Uh, this is a random errand. So, now he's going to show one of the sounds in the folder. I don't know exactly what is going to happen, but more or less I can be uh, into that. I'm going to put that a bit more faster. No? So I have 10 sounds and he decides what, what kind of sound is going to happen. No? But there's uh, another ways to do that. For example, I'm going to silence that. Silence. Uh, I'm going to use another track. For example, uh, let's say, actually, I can use just the S. Uh, let's say, BD. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a sequence a bit more longer and easier also. I had in snare. I'm making this sequence of four 
samples. It's <laughs> super straightforward. Uh, but I can tell the computer to play at uh, the, the reverse sequence. So he's playing the, from the last one to the first one. No? And, but the interesting thing I, is that I can uh, tell the computer to make, for example, every, every, every four times the, the opposite. So he's doing exactly what I want to No, At the fourth, he makes the opposite uh, sequence, right? He's doing it? Yeah, no? But this is the, the, the another interesting, or another layer, or I don't know, the, another way, which is uh, every, uh, I can use a word called sometimes, sometimes, sometimes ref, sometimes ref. So I don't know <laughs> when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen sometimes. Well, it, it gets uh, more complicated than that. It's not that easier all the time, but more or less you can understand the, 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 the things, no? So I wanted to show that in this very uh, pedagogical way for you to know that it's not uh, that the, the, the we are just using code, but it's not like, oh, I can't understand anything because it's code and you are all programmers and hackers and I don't get it. I, I, I'm not a hacker either or programmer. And there's a lot of people that is super virtual, no, how do you say? Uh, some, uh, uh, yeah, they are super fast, uh, uh, talk, uh, uh, writing and something like that. I'm not, I have another ability. So you can, you can use different things, different tools, different, I don't know, whatever, uh, instruments. So yeah. So I think uh, about you were saying before, the different layers that, for example, live coding has, no? Uh, one is the sound. You can go to an algorithm or a, or a, a live coding session in, and just uh, close your eyes and enjoy the music most of the time. <laughs> um, so this is one layer. You have another one, which is the text or the code. So you can uh, do two things. If you understand everything that is happening, you can go to the, I don't know, to the code and see, oh, no, okay, this is one function and, 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 and this is the, that, no, no? In, in this technical way. Or if you don't know, you can just do what, uh, Luis was saying, it's just, ah, she's changing this, or she just used hush, so I can understand this is hushing, the thing. You know? um, and I think there's another one, which is very interesting, that is that you can see how the brain of the live coder is working. Because, if, for example, you are using like this, uh, movement in the mouse, you see that he's thinking wh what's, the, <laughs> what's next or something like that, no? So I think it has, uh, I don't know, different lectures. And yeah, that's it. I don't know if you Thank you, to. Lina. Actually, uh, it's, it's, there's something that it's been, uh, I've been thinking while I, will, I was listening to all of you and also like um, um, in a way that's about the emotional relation. Uh, with this uh, abstraction and sensitive of scope of the listening, right? And now somehow you brought it and in a way because something that actually could be so abstract and completely detached to sensation as code, all of a sudden it's, it's becoming emotional through life coding. Um, I don't know, would you, like to, would you like to actually navigate that relationship, that back and forth um, decoding and recoding uh, uh, relation. Who would like to start? I want. I just want to say that uh, this idea you said about like the coder thinking and moving the mouse made me think like instantly in YouTube gameplays when you see the way a player moves, no, and it's this kind of performativity that it's hidden behind mm -hmm. the computer most of the times, but when it appears, I think it's super intense, no, and and it also it's like another way to approach like 
these creations. I don't know. I just, it came to my <laughs> mind like this. Mm -hmm. No, but it's, it's, it's related to that, no? Because we are, we are putting our sensations in that way. I mean, I'm not closing my eyes and feeling <laughs> the thing, but I'm, I'm thinking and, I, and I'm there, no? I'm, I'm in the computer. Mm -hmm. So I think the emotion is, is there yeah. some, some way. And you're listening, actually, and that's... Yeah, that's sure. That you're it's, listening. it's that interaction you were talking about. Exactly. And, and this is actually like uh, you're, you're, you're telling the machine what to do, but you don't know what the machine is going to say, and that, that, that's the space for maybe um, emotion or sensation or just listening, the power yeah, yeah, of listening, yeah. right? Yeah, that's the way of uncertainty you want to, yeah. to interact with, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the determinacy we were talking before. Determination, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It, what? Go, go. So go. I just, um, I like this idea of code being something that has to be like super specific for the machine. Mm -hmm. And actually, like in, I'm going to what I know, eh? but in interactive fiction programming, like there's this programming language that it's, it's called natural language. It is a language that tries to imitate uh, human language, well, English, and it would be nice to have it in all kinds of languages, yeah. even if they have different ways of grammatically uh, work. And it's really nice to code with this language and um, realize the ambiguity of natural language and human language mm -hmm. and the way that no, the machine or the computer, whatever, no, understands you in in a way, and I love, well, I think it's super interesting. And I, I wanted to ask if, because I don't know about live coding, if, is there a space for ambiguity here? Like, not, not randomness, but I mean, could the code understand something that you weren't meaning? I don't know if I'm yeah. trying to... Actually, I would like to, to <laughs> complement that by asking if there's a way, actually, you could say things in a different way, and then it, it would be a way to say exactly more or less what you mean, but by saying it in a different way, with a different... Yeah, uh, well, it depends on the software you're using also. But, and, and there's a lot uh, to, to do already with, with live coding, but you have different languages, and with this language you can, you can say the same different ways right. and there's also some languages from a high level i mean more is more similar to to another language or language or english <laughs> uh, where you just write some words and and this this thing do something with the sound or even with visuals mm -hmm. um, but there's another ones that are super low level so you so the machine is capable of making more uh, difficult stuff for us but not for the machine not you were you were talking about mm. that also before it depends on the on the level but everything can be done with code but, but is it readability um, related to complexity or the potential of compl complexity I, th I think maybe it is because uh, Behind all this, I'm showing you, so this sometimes there's a complex machine that is going... Because that word, for me, is, the sometimes word is really intriguing. Like totally. in that, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's English, you understand that word, but in the yeah. code it's like, I wish there was like a, 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 like a yeah, yeah. something uh, like more, like lower the level term, to, yeah. to say what sort of random is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can go random. there and so change whatever you sometimes want. Sometimes it's like, so. it's really uncertain as a word, as a command for a computer. Yeah, and, somebody, really? and somebody wrote that <laughs> mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in a precise moment and decide, yeah. okay, sometimes it's this <laughs> random that <laughs> such and such. But you can, you can change that if you want and you can build your own language and, and just talk with the machine. Mm -hmm. But you also need to have this level, no, this low level and talk with the machine and say, okay, what we're going to do. And then build this kind of interface, no? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think Tidal Cycles, for example, is an interface. It's not a graphical interface where you can change things and stuff, but it's, it is, no? Totally, yeah. it's, mm -hmm. like, it's like your controller or mm -hmm. your uh, text. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. kind of. It, but it is some. I mean, it's interesting that the. I mean, the sometimes instruction works. Yeah. I mean, if you listen, it, it just does it sometimes. It's okay, yeah. and, and it's true that you have to. You could read the instruction and see exactly what they mean. They mean I, perhaps there is a chance operations. Perhaps it's just irre- irregular enough. But when you hear it as music, it is okay. it's okay. It's doing what I said. It's just doing this sometimes. Yeah, yeah there's and sometimes. A, there's so it's a, a, everything happens a, at a different level of complexity and then comes back to the human level when you think that things are normal. So for us it's sometimes, but we know that a machine is not able to do a chance operation. We know that, but they fake it really good. Uh, maybe Agnes? Uh, uh, do you, would you like to say anything? Because actually um, you were more skeptical and you actually pointed out the idea of the obscurity of, of, of code and maybe <laughs> you would like you to, <laughs> <laughs> which is not any more obscure, but maybe she would like to say something about that. Uh, and uh, as you're not here, I think it's, do you hear me? Oh, wait, 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 you are... wait. I have to... Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you and we see you very big. Now now we see you and yeah. <laughs> Loud and clear. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, can can you repeat? I, I don't I don't hear you. No, uh, yeah. Now uh, if you want to, if you wanted to say something because actually you've been mentioned here by you and some other people, because you actually, in the previous conversations we were having uh, to prepare the talk, you mentioned the obscurity sometimes when you see a live coder writing and you see, the, you see a screen full of commands and uh, that's, you know, obscurity. Maybe, as we've been already dis- been discussing this, maybe you would like to, to say yeah. what you think. Yes, uh, it, it was interesting the, that uh, that the, Lina said, you know, these different levels of the code, you know, with, with when, when you go an, in a live coding uh, concert, you no, know, it's, it's, it's interesting, you no, know, because like Lina said, it's interesting this, this kind of knowledge, this level of knowledge, you no, know, because you can hear the music, but maybe you don't uh, know what is this kind of numbers and these kinds of, of signs and symbols, no? And it's very interesting, this kind of, this kind of uh, um, situation, uh, this kind, these different levels, no? Of the code allow for a, a multiplicity of the coding ba- based on the subjective experience, no? Um, but uh, I don't know if, um, for me, it, it's strange, no? This jerarchy, no? That that this kind of situation produce, no? This uh, political jerarchy, no? That this situation produce. But like uh, Luis said, no? Is 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 uh, for me ignoring the code is also an opportunity, no? Mm-hmm. Ignoring the code does does not mean not being interesting in it, no? I don't know, it's uh, like, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, I want to show you uh, a project. <laughs> it's not live coding, but it's similar. Uh, let me show you, it's here, yes, here. It's this project of uh, Dylan Tajiev and um, uh, he do something like live coding, no, but in a uh, Microsoft Excel. Okay. No? And it's a very interesting project. If you want, uh, we can we can show this video if you want. Oh, but we need the sound. I change the sound. How to you report? <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
Parodies make jump patterns and melodies and chord progressions, arrange them into a track, and when you're done arranging them, export it and turn it into an actual Ableton project file. Once you've made your song in Excel, what are you going to do? We'll put it on Spotify and on iTunes, of course. Segue, the sponsor of this video comes in. Which just I don't know. For me, the interesting is breaking these rules uh, about the code. No, it's, it's interesting the the way that that this this guy, you know, is is not using uh, a live coding program. No, he, he um, I don't know, corrupt the Excel, no, for play like a live coder because it's, it's maybe the same, no, the, the same uh, codification or, uh, okay, uh, come. okay, the same or similar codification, no, and, and process maybe. Yeah, regarding that, actually, you brought something which is the idea, and we ha also have been discussing in the previous conversations before about the, the notion of performing code or performing with code and uh, how we do interface with code. Maybe you would like to, because I think she actually showed something very, you know, because, you know, breaking actually the notion of a live coder, someone like a jig, and uh, I, I don't know, I would like, if you want to go. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it's something I constantly think about uh, uh, performing in, in, in general, and, and code is a, it's a, it's a slippery thing in, mm -hmm. uh, because it's like uh, the first image that comes to me when I imagine performing code is, is possibly live coding because it's, it's like you're sort of uh, uh, still programming and making music, reacting, and, and so on to, to, the, to the act of coding. But... Um, um, but I, I wonder if, if that is the only option, no? or, or the, I mean, it's, it's visible to me, but um, for example, this idea of trying to, 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 to go uh, underneath what coding means, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, it's, it's also interesting because you bypass the, the computer language in itself. It's, it's not the something, or, or you, you... So hiding that uh, adds uh, uh, room for other interpretations as yeah. well. So uh, I, I don't know. This this is also a question uh, that is uh, I don't know whether it's hot or not. But it, it's a, it's something in the discussion in life coding circles whether to project your code or no, whether to show that part of the uh, interface or whether that is necessary. That adds something to the performance or to the musical experience, to the artistic experience as a whole. So. Um, I think life coding, I don't know, it, it, it sounds here like something like super academical or serious or something like that, but it's just a way of doing, doing things and doesn't matter at the end if it's life coding or, or not, yeah. you know? or yeah. if you're showing your code or not, you're going to see in the, in the algorithm. Uh, there's a lot of people that doesn't show the code anymore or it doesn't matter if you are wrote, writing your code or not. In the algorithm, it's more like you know what you're doing, you know your algorithms and you made your own and, that, and that's it. No, it's, not, it's not a matter of... But I think it, 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 it adds uh, it, a different uh, sort of approach as what you, what you underline. Is the, is the listening experience? Is it mm -hmm. listening? Is it reading? Is it... Uh, uh, watching, mm. because I mean, those mm -hmm. are three approaches that uh, can be represented in perform performing. Have has a certain connotation, especially if we come from, I don't know, uh, uh, movement arts, dance, theater, and so on. Mm. Just mu mu music itself, playing an instrument, is purely a, a gesture thing. It's something that goes yeah. mm -hmm. not but not through reading, but if you isolate the performance part from from the listening, then you, you get something else that is not. Yeah, and so actually, yeah, somehow it, it bring, brings me back to the notion of attention that we were saying before and the notion of attention regarding listening, right? And uh, how listening distributes that attention and that, you know, it's not, not, not only implying because it's like um, sometimes we, we haven't, I mean, like we, it's very clear with ambient music, right? When you pay attention, I mean, actually ambient music was not, not to be paying attention all the time. You know, Brian, you know, was um, the one who was like... Uh, like um, 
problematizing this uh, attention, right? When mm -hmm. we when we're listening, but I think you introduced that. It's like, are we all the time listening to all the time, or are we watching, or what are, or I mean, you know, what's happening in this mm -hmm. situation, and the demand also. Yeah, or making sense uh, yeah. using, I mean, bits and pieces yeah. from yeah. from all of these uh, perceptual mm -hmm. senses and processing senses. I think it's a complex phenomenon. Totally. Yeah. I have what well, I want to say, just whenever I've been, a lot of times that I've seen, or sometimes I've seen live coding uh, performances, I don't know why, I've, um, because it happened like this, a small epiphanies that I understood, oh, this yeah. is happening, this. <laughs> For me, I felt them as if there were some kind of pedagogical thing happening in between, and it broke my experience as a... Yeah. As a, at least what I was uh, looking for at that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do a lot of times what to, was to try to be a little bit um, negligent. How do you say that in English? Negligent or something? Could be negligent or... Um, as a, as re a listener. Re rejector? Reject? I don't know. I don't know. Well, no. but trying to be a little bit um, messy or yeah. lousy yeah. when trying to... Listening, listening in the broad sense, which is also, like, I guess, reading the code or finding... And I think it's super interesting, no? Mm -hmm. Like to try to, yeah, delegate like this position you have suddenly as a listener, no? To maybe I don't have to be like a good listener, no? Or a loyal listener, no? But I, I think we can we can have the same discussion with every concert. Of course. Because yeah, if we if you are going to a guitar concert, concert yeah, yeah, and it happens sure. that you don't know how to play a, a guitar. Totally. Then you listen better or worse, or no? You just enjoy the thing as you with, with your things, no? It's a, I yeah. don't know, a no, huge. But, the, but then you enter the cultural codes that are present, <laughs> and uh, I mean the ri ritual of the concert is something yes. that is very well learned, and yeah. it's, uh -huh. and and that for a lot of people is broken just because of the fact you have a computer instead of an instrument. Sometimes mm -hmm. that creates um, uh, a, a distortion, a cognitive distortion for for certain people in. Mm. And this, this sort of, uh, I mean, uh, the saying, no, that watching an electronic musician playing on a stage with a computer, you, it, uh, she can be reading her email. What, <laughs> yeah. that, no, like, I mean, there's this sort yeah. of... Uh, That's uh, why we show the code. And, because but that comes from, from the rock stardomship and possibly yeah. and from the classical music virtuoso player. I yeah. mean, there are many... Yeah, this is very interesting. And in fact, live coding, it's, as far as I know, the, I mean, it's the most interesting performance, in terms of performing, because, I mean, the problem of the stage has not been solved. Exactly. No. And, uh, and uh, this, this is something that, that I remember having this discussion with Alba G. Corral. I mean, it's so lame how the visuals so many times are just something to happen because nothing is really happening in the stage. I mean, because everything is being done by computers. But you want to have the stage. So... <laughs> And, and sometimes the, the, the dishonesty of the whole totally. performance of computer or the whole electronic music. Yeah. And, and, and having someone like above of the rest of the people yeah. who are there, this is creating a hierarchy yeah. between the one who is performing and the rest of the bodies who are there dancing. You know? And in the end, that would have been a fantastic experience just to get rid of the stage audience totally. uh, uh, format. But then again, in the, in the, 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 live, the live coding session, uh, solves that in a fantastic way, and it's that the, the, the musician is busy and it's worried. So it's, she's not just, hey, hey. No, no, he's, I mean, <laughs> he's trying to do something interesting. And it's a fantastic performance to see someone at work focused and, uh, and enjoying. I mean, sometimes it's like, oh, I like that. And it's not that it's not fun, but it's an honest experience. And for once, you have an electronic musician doing something in the stage that it's worth seeing, and it's interesting as performance, which is a rare, uh, a rare experience. I mean, yeah. Though it's, a, it's also amazing to have the possibility to just hit play. Yeah. But I think it's For a sure. marvelous spot that the, um, electronic musicians have. I, I, I think, I think and it's I, something of course, and that I we like, need to defend yeah, as well. Of no? course, and, I, I, well, and, and some, for in, I'm sorry, to, um, to inter but... No. Some people do that very... I remember a, a concert of Cat, Cat Hands in, in a Lem Festival in, in Gracia. And he just... What he, I mean, he played every song and he just stepped in front of the computer <laughs> and was dancing. Yeah. It's, I mean, he was very honest about, I'm doing nothing, I'm just playing my files. I and think this is... Fantastic this is a, concert. This is another way to, to perform with code, actually, because you, you, you did everything in your home and you just hit play. play. 
and it's a performance actually. No? I think so it's amazing. Another way. Yeah. For example, for me, it's happened that I, uh, sometimes when working with I don't know Game Boys or whatever, when doing like cheap tune back then, um, I would prepare almost everything back home, and I would hit play and I would wait for the song to happen, and I would be a 100 times more anxious when doing this than when I was playing guitar or something, <laughs> because everything relayed on the machines, and I, I thought yeah. it was super interesting. And I guess it's also related to this idea of lousiness or negligencia, I don't know how to say it, but... Negligency, let's say yeah. it, maybe. Excuse ne us, but... You uh, can just say it <laughs> Negligency. But yeah, also as a performer, you know, like, uh, suddenly, like, machines are the ones, like, who have the the power, no, and they decide if the show has to stop, they decide it to stop, and that's all. Yeah. I think it's also really nice. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the honesty regarding the fear, you know, with uh, that layer of uh, technology, and I don't know, thank you for the honesty. And, uh, and actually saying that actually you could play something, because, you know, when you people are like struggling and, and like sweating, and, you know, it's... it's it's nice to hear. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, they are saying that we are running out of time. Uh, so maybe it's a moment just uh, uh, to open up the mic. And if there's someone that would like to say anything here, no questions. Uh, and I'm not sure if someone is actually checking if there's some, uh, there are questions on the YouTube uh, channel. Nobody's checking that, I think. We are here all alone. Oh, there you are. Wait, wait. Uh, maybe we need the mic. If you would make us, yeah, please, because Could for you, the yeah, streaming, we I'm need the sorry. mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, that I was interested in in the thing you you talked about um, about the the fear. The fear when you are coding, uh, because um, when when you are coding with a, a programming language, uh, you are using a language which is created to make things a bit easier. Finally, there are multiple levels. You you have a program. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. You have a programming language, and you use then another programming language. And then you go, and you also said something about this, Alina, Lina, and you go to the low level, and finally you are only manipulating bits, and bits are finally electrical pulses. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that the, the power you can have is um, working with that pulses that are the electricity. So. When, when you make, for example, um, a plasma speaker, you can see the graphic, and that's also sound. Mm -hmm. um, and I was the, the question because no, now I am here. I am getting like <laughs> 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 no. That um, the, the question is that if you feel that that fear uh, comes from the no no controlling the code, no, finally, or that you don't have the control. Of the of that machine, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, totally. No, I think so. Well, I mm -hmm. I've never had like the ambition of uh, like controlling or yeah, like I don't know the word in English. Like, um, see, yeah, 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 totally. And but I think well, I have no idea. Maybe I'm entering in the horrible terrain. But <laughs> at the end, you would always be able to go lower and lower, no? Lower mm -hmm. in beats, then you have yeah, sound in the physical space and whatever. So it, there are a lot of things happening that are. I think it's nice to lift things out of control. I don't know, eh? But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But. <laughs> no, yeah. but totally. No, yeah. no, the I think uncertainty it's actually. And what, it's connected yeah. with this idea of. Yeah, being a, a, an ignorant player in a way, no? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. um, okay, five more minutes to go. Is there anybody else that would like to say anything? Um, well, I don't know. Any of you would like to add something else? I'm going to now say what is coming afterwards. Oh, sorry? No. No. Okay, no. great. Would you like to add anything else? Mm. 
No? <laughs> okay, no. So maybe just um, to thank you, all of you, for the conversations, also for the previous conversations, and uh, thank you, everybody uh, who made this possible. Uh, also, Agnes, I'm sorry, I'm, there you are. Would you like to add anything? No, it's okay, it's okay. Thank okay. you for the, for the invitation, and it was a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much. And um, actually, um, as Luis was saying before now, uh, uh, we are going to head towards uh, heat towards Hangar because we have a, a session of um, an algorithm with uh, thanks to Top Lab. And uh, we are going to be a few people uh, because of the restrictions there uh, physically, but you can actually follow the, the streaming of the algorithm uh, through the YouTube channel. And uh, that's it, I think. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank